All Cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling All Cars. Attention All Cars broadcast 238 regarding a murder. No description of the suspect in this case. That's all. Rose and Quest. Remember the time Aunt Aggie and her five children dropped in on you unexpectedly and you had to sleep on the floor? And how stiff and achy you were in every joint the next morning? Friends, that's exactly how your motor feels and acts when you consign it to the park bench, so to speak, with only the threadbare covering of inferior oil instead of giving it the cushioning protection of real lube. You expect your car to give you many thousands of miles of faithful service, don't you? Very well, treat it accordingly. Give it life-prolonging comfort and ease of operation by changing its staff of life to Real Lube, the enduring motor oil that really protects every vital moving part with a satin smooth covering. Smooth, yes, and at the same time so strong and impenetrable that the devastating heat of high speeds and hot weather cannot reach your motor to get in their dirty work. So when you get Rio Grande cracked, the gasoline that powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment, wherever it is sold than any other brand, get Real Lube, the finest motor oil sold in the West. The story we are to hear tonight was taken in the main from facts on file in the Los Angeles Police Department. We have therefore asked Chief of Police James E. Davis to preface our program. Chief Davis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes the most dramatic work on the part of a peace officer goes unnoticed by the rank and file of a city's people simply because that work has not been blazoned in headlines. Sometimes an important case is broken, but the story behind it never breaks, for the average peace officer does not want publicity. He does not need it. He does his duty as he sees it and does not look for praise. The vast majority of criminal cases are investigated and closed without fanfare, such as our story tonight, because persons still living might be hurt by the broadcast of certain facts surrounding our story. We have purposely changed both local and personnel. It is our desire to present our programs without harm to anyone, but to bring out most certainly that crime of any sort is an unprofitable enterprise. I shall reserve additional facts for the end of the program. In a spacious home in one of Los Angeles' most exclusive residential districts, a father and his son engage in heated argument. What do I care about your plans? What right have you to make plans for me? Son, you're not thinking. You're just standing there shouting. And that isn't going to get you anywhere. I am thinking. That's all I've been doing, day and night, is thinking, thinking. If that were the case, you wouldn't be talking like an idiot. Am I an idiot because I've fallen in love? You did the same thing. You laughed at the opposition and resentment. You went right ahead and married Mother, in spite of everything. I'm not offering any opposition. I'm not holding any resentment. You can marry anyone you please, and good luck to you, but not now. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Why should I obey you when you refuse to give me a logical reason? We won't go into that again. My reason for demanding a delay is sufficiently logical to satisfy me. That's a big help, isn't it? I'll run over and see Mary now and tell her you have a logical reason why we shouldn't get married. She'll probably appreciate that. She'll doubtless have great respect for her future husband. Oh, go out somewhere and cool off. And come back and talk to me like a sensible person. It's my turn to stand on my own feet. I can see where it's going to be necessary for me to take whatever action I consider advisable. What do you mean? Uh, you'll find out. And all your money won't do you any good. I'm going to get what I want in this case. Understand that? No matter how I get it. Uh, hello, Ted. Yes? Uh, this is uh, Jim Ritter. Oh, how are you, Jim? <laughs> Terrible. I've, uh, I've guessed wrong, Ted. What do you mean? I sold 50,000 shares of Consolidated Pipe short. Wow, it jumped four points today. It didn't go up until about two minutes before the market closed, so I have until Monday morning to cover. Uh, Ted, can you dig up 200,000 over the weekend? Not a chance in the world, Jim. Oh, I thought perhaps you... Oh, you know I'd do it if I could, Jim, but I'm sold up. How about Westcott? Well, he'd give it to me, I suppose, but... With what? Oh, never mind, Ted. Well, thanks all the same. 
Sorry, I can't help you, Jim. No, that's all right. Bye. I'm sorry, Mary. I can't see you tonight. No, no, it's nothing serious. I... I have something to do. I'll call you as soon as it's done. Goodbye, darling. I'll show him. Hayden, what are you doing in here? Begging your pardon, sir. You told me to bring you some coffee. That's right, I did. Well, after this, knock when you want to come in my room. Uh, yes, Mr. Westcott. I have enough trouble without the servants spying on me. Put the coffee down and get out of here. Yes, sir. Yes. Hayden! Yes, sir. Hayden! Yes, sir. Coming, sir. Where's my son? Why, well, I... That is a... Well, come, come out of it. Why are you stammering? Well, I don't think I should say, sir. Say what? What's the matter with you? Well, uh, Mr. Westcott, Master Carl is in a very bad humor, sir. So am I. Get him. Tell him I want to see him at once. Yes, sir. Oh, shall I wait until you finish writing that letter, no, sir? No, you heard me. Tell him to come here at once. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A rat. Hello? Hello, Ralph. Yeah. Ted Lowe. Yeah? It worked. Ritter called me earlier in the evening and wanted to borrow 200000 I referred it to you. Nice work. Did he tell you why he wanted the money? Yes, he said he sold consolidated pipe, sure. <laughs> See me, Monty Ted. I'll make it worth your while. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Did you want to see me? Yes, I'm tired of this sulking and I want to stop it. I won't have you telling your troubles to my servants. I haven't been telling my troubles to your servants. Hayden and you have been cooking up something. He acts like a scared rabbit every time I mention your name. I wouldn't put up with this nonsense in my business, and I'd be hanged if I'd put up with it in my home. Is that all you have to say? No. I'm also tired of your impudence, because I won't let you marry the first petticoat you set your eyes on. Dad, you can't say that to me. I know what's best for you, and I'm going to... How would you like to hear a few things I'm going to do? The only thing I want from you is silence. Well, you're going to get more than that before this thing's over. Are you insolent, Papa? Well, Hayden, what in blazes do you want? Uh, begging your pardon, sir. Mr. Ritter is here. He says it's very important. Oh, Ritter, eh? Then I'll see him. Let me go, Carl. I'll finish this later. Mm, business first, of course. Yes. Well, I'm warning you, Dad. Later may be much too late. Go on, get out. Threats are useless weapons. Yeah, well, you'll find out. Oh, hi, girl. Well, Good evening, Westcott. What's on your mind, Ritter? I'll come to the point very briefly. Because either you will or you won't. Either I will or I won't what? Either you will or will not lend me $200,000. <laughs> Any good reason why I should? Well, yes, in a way. You dropped a hint that Consolidated Pipe was due for a drop. I followed your suggestion and sold 50,000 shares short. By now, you know the fix I'm in. Why do you sell short when you have the money to cover? I don't want advice. I want money. Do I get it? Uh, will you pardon me a moment until I finish this letter? Of course. What uh, security have you to offer? My word. <laughs> well, there. Uh, I guess that'll take care of that. There is a favor you could do for me, Ritter. And in return, I might be persuaded to lend you the money. I know exactly what the favor is. Yeah. And I won't do it. On the other hand, I can do you a favor by forgetting to mention a few things you wouldn't want anyone to hear. I knew you'd try that sooner or later. Well, I've got you where I want you, Mr. Ritter. Yeah, that's what you think. Your best bet is to take a boat to China or jump in the river. Why, you dirty crap. What? You... what is it? What's the matter? Who asked you to come in here? Get out. Yeah, but I heard you quarrel. I can take care of myself. Get out of here. Beg pardon, sir. Did you ring? Yes, mail this letter at once. We're in blazes of the stamps. Oh, here. And hurry. Uh, yes, sir. I'll go, too, if you don't mind. You can keep your money, Westcott, for all the good it'll ever do you. Now, see here, Mr. Ritter. Carl, I believe I told you to leave. I'm not through with Mr. Ritter. I think that before we get through, before we... Oh, Westcott, what's the matter? Something, uh, Ritter. Oh, catch him, he's falling. <sighs> I've got him. I call Hayden. Get some water. Uh, Hayden. Hayden, something's happened to Dad. Oh, gosh, she's passed out. Call the doctor, Mr. Ritter. I'll get the water myself. Never mind the water, Carl. But... Never mind the water. You mean? Yes, he's dead. Further investigation showed that Westcott's death was due to cyanide poisoning, but how the deadly drug was administered or by whom was still a mystery. Captain Wallace of the homicide detail assigned Lieutenant Sanderson and Ryan to investigate. There's something wrong in this Westcott case, Andy. Something we've overlooked. I don't doubt that, but I haven't any idea what it might be. I noticed that the papers this morning fell back on the old heart failure gag. That's fine. As long as they talk that way, we'll have time to work. 
It's when they start yelling murder without anything to go on that I get worried. Well, I still can't see how a man can die from cyanide poisoning unless he took it himself or somebody gave it to him. Yeah, that's sound as far as it goes, Ryan. But obviously he did take it. According to the stories we've gotten so far, there were four men in that room. None of them admit touching anything. None of them saw anything eaten or drunk. Yet suddenly one of them topples over dead from cyanide. Hmm, could have been suicide. I don't think so. Evidently, Westcott was telling them all where they could go to. He seemed entirely in command of the situation. No, I think he would be the last one of the group to have reason for suicide. Well, then it's a cinch we've overlooked something important. Meantime, the guy that dishes out cyanide in small doses is still loose. That's right. I want you boys to go over that Westcott place from cellar to attic and bring Westcott's butler, young Westcott, and that Ritter bird back here. <laughs> Any particular reason for going in the back way, Sandy? No, none except Tommy Devlin's line and wait for us at the front door. Uh, News Hawk Devlin, right on the job, eh? Yeah. Very good, Sanderson. Trying to put one over on the press, are you? Lying in wait, did you say, sir? Oh, hiya, Ryan. What are you boys doing on a suicide case? Yeah, you see, Ryan, I told you we'd get into an argument before this was over. Oh, stop kidding, Sandy. What's the idea? So this looks like a suicide to you, does it, Tommy? Yep. What's the matter with the stories your paper's been running? It was about heart failure. Or don't you read the papers? Nope, I write them. What did you say if I told you I think this is a murder case? I'd say you're nuts. See, Sandy? You can't win. Yeah. Look, Sandy, let's get together. Third innocent taxi down the street full of the DA's men, a couple of private detective agencies are staking out the place across the street. I wouldn't be surprised even to see the sheriff's office crowd blow in here any minute. Now, what's coming off around here? Well, Tommy, from where I sit, this looks like a perfect crime. You call it a suicide. It's neither one. There's no such thing as a perfect crime, and Westcott didn't kill himself. Now, let's get inside before we have to argue with some cop and try to identify ourselves. Well, wait a minute. How do you happen to know about this car from the servants' quarters? We've seen blueprints of the house. If I'm not mistaken, this door ought to lead us into the kitchen. Ah, good guessing, Sandy. Let's eat. Anybody that eats or drinks in this house is really nuts. I still don't get your reason for coming in the back way, Sandy. Yeah, well, in the first place, I thought we'd dodge you. Oh, thanks, pal. Yeah, and in the second place, I didn't want our friends in the taxi to see us come in. And in the third place, I'd just assume those babies across the street didn't see us. Besides that, I don't want the officer on the door to know we're here for a while yet. How do you happen to be uh, around in back here, Devlin? Who, 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 me? Yes, you. Well, I was just trying to find out why Westcott committed suicide. Look, Tommy. You remember that time Charlie Stelmack shot himself and you insisted it was murder? Why don't you give up? This is murder. Let's see you prove it. Keep quiet. The library's just across the hall. That's where Westcott died, isn't it? Yeah. Wait a minute. I thought I heard someone in that room. Throw your flashlight in there. Yeah, it seems empty. I guess I was wrong. Now then, let's see. Westcott was here by the desk, writing. Ritter must have been about... There on the sofa. The butler probably came from the same direction we did. The son said he was upstairs. Sandy, look here. What is it? See that little piece of white paper on the blotter there? Mm hmm. Just about the size of a pinhead. Yeah, if that's what I think it is, we've got the answer to one of our questions. Sandy, Ryan, come in. What's on your mind, Tommy? Take a look at that wall safe. Open. Oh, why in thunder didn't we look for that when we came in? You're not going to tell me there's a safe cracker in the house, too. Well, the safe didn't open itself, and it was closed this morning. I saw it. It looks like whoever opened it did it recently, then. The safe looks full. Let's close it again. I've got a hunch we frightened somebody away from that job. Come on, let's get upstairs and find somebody who hasn't had time to get to sleep. I hear somebody coming. Switch off that light. Is someone in here? Hayden, is that you? Funny. Must be hearing things. Huh. Young Westcott. So I heard. This is getting complicated. I think we ought to come out in the open. Now, I've got a better plan. I've got to get upstairs and look for something. Sign out, I suppose. Exactly. Where do you expect to find it? Stick around, reporter. you find out. You know, Westcott's actions just now may have been a bluff. He's had time to dispose of anything he might have taken from the safe. Yes, assuming he's the one who opened it. Well, why don't you get Gaskell out here and get the fingerprints off that safe? Mr. Devlin, at times you amaze me. There's probably a couple of dozen prints on that safe, and you expect to find a murderer by checking. Oh, only a suggestion. Hmm. Seems to be a convention here tonight. wonder who that is. Well, let's go over by the door and see. I'm James Ritter, 
I got a phone call that I was wanted here. Ritter. Who sent for you? I, uh, I don't know exactly. You see, my valet took the call. But he said Mr. Westcott. Young Mr. Westcott called. Well, you wait here in the library. I'll find out about this. Quick, duck into this room here. It's the music room. I want to listen to this. This is beginning to smack of a 10, 20, 30 melodrama. Oh, uh, Mr. Westcott. Well? Will you come down here a minute? Into the library. Mm, sure, just a minute. Hayden. Hayden. Come in here a minute. Now, Mr. Ritter, go right in. Looks like Joe's getting suspicious. Mm. Hope he doesn't lose his temper and run the whole bunch in. Well, what are we going to do? You stay here, both of you, and find out what happens here. I'm going upstairs by the back way. Gosh, I've just been waiting for something like this. Okay, but make it snappy. Now, Mr. Westcott, what was the idea of sending for Mr. Ritter? I didn't send for him. I didn't phone anybody. Well, how about you, Hayden? Well, I haven't the faintest idea who could have called Mr. Ritter. Mm. Are you sure you did get a call, Ritter? <laughs> Why, of course I'm sure. You don't think I'd come over here in the middle of the night just for the ride, do you? Well, I don't know. You might at that. Well, what do you mean by that remark? Well, never mind. I have a good notion to run the whole bunch of you in right now. Yes? For what? Don't worry. I can find something. That won't be necessary, Joe. I'll just take young Mr. Westcott along with me, if you don't mind. Here, Sandy, what are you doing here? Come on out, Ryan. I've got a few questions I want to ask the young man privately. What's this all about? I haven't done anything. Joe, take these other two outside, will you? Sure. Come on, you two. Outside. What do you want to talk to me about? Now, take it easy, son. I'm Lieutenant Sanderson, Police Department. This is Lieutenant Ryan. And uh, this bird's a reporter, but he's harmless. I'll sue you for libel, Sandy. Come on, cut out the funny stuff and get to the point. What is this? Mr. Westcott, I might as well tell you that you're suspected of murdering your father. Are you crazy? Maybe. Why should I want to kill my own father? That's what we want to know. Was Ritter in on this? I don't even know what you're talking about. You quarreled with him, didn't you? Sure, but what fellow doesn't row with his father sometime or other? And do they also threaten to kill their fathers, too? That's a lie. I never threatened to kill him. We have statements that say you did. What's the combination to your father's safe? I don't know. You didn't just whistle, and that safe opened up. Why, you... Uh... Take it easy, son. Uh, that'll just give you something else to explain. Tell me, how'd you get that safe open? I'm not talking anymore. Go ahead. Do whatever you want to. It'll beat me up, like you cops always do. I'm not talking. Uh, want me to do it, Sandy? No. Now, look here, son. You've been seeing too many gangster pictures or reading reporters' yarns about the police. We're not going to beat you up or do anything else to you. We just want the truth. Well, you've got all you're going to get out of me. How'd this bottle of cyanide get into your room? What? You heard me. I don't know anything about it. I never saw it before. Of course not. How'd it get there? I don't know. I won't tell you a thing. Okay, son. Come along. Maybe a few days in a cell will change your mind. Where's Ryan? He's in room 47, talking to Ritter. Let's go down there. Are you going to tell me that Ritter killed old man Westcott? Maybe. Who knows? Well, if you ask me, I don't think you do. Hello, Sandy. Uh, what have you found out? Nothing. I'm waiting for you. Hi, Mr. Ritter. Very well, thanks. What's the reason for bringing me down here, Lieutenant? I thought this matter was settled. Well, Mr. Ritter, sometimes these things take a little longer to close than we expect. There are a few things that need explaining. Thought Charles. Such as you're needing $200,000 Saturday night and you're going to Mr. Westcott's house to borrow that amount. Well, you can hardly call that a discovery, Lieutenant. Yeah, that's true. But we found out also that you met your obligation Monday morning. That's true, too. I made a payment in full. Where did you get that much money? I'm not at liberty to say. I presume that you're aware that $200,000 disappeared from Mr. Westcott's safe between the time he died Saturday night and the time you paid your debt Monday morning. Certainly, I knew that. But I understood you had already arrested young Westcott for that. Who told you that? Uh, why, why, I'm not sure. Anyway, how many men are you going to accuse of that crime? As many as seem implicated in it. We can't find the money. Young Westcott says he didn't take it. The natural inference is that you two are working together, that he took the money and gave it to you. I say now, that's a possibility, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's why we ask you to come down and talk it over. And very nice of you, Lieutenant. Uh, but have you given any thought to the question of why there were $200,000 in a comparatively unprotected safe? Yeah, I imagine that was Mr. Westcott's business. That's correct. It was there because he knew I'd be there and try and borrow it. He knew you were coming to borrow the money? That's right. He intended to lend it to me on certain conditions. So you see, it wasn't necessary for me to steal it. Did you threaten to kill him? If I didn't, I meant to. <laughs> well, Ritter, it's a good story, but we'll have to hold you. And that's so? On what charge? As an accomplice in the murder of Westcott. And while you're talking your way out of things, think up a good one about why you bought a large quantity of cyanide and what you intended doing with it. Thank you.
With two logical suspects in custody, police still did not feel entirely sure that the murderer of Westcott had been apprehended. Certain that a crime had been committed, Sanderson and Ryan returned to the Westcott home, taking with them the dead man's son. Now, Carl, I want you to show me again just where you were standing when your father fell. No, I was over there, just inside the door. And you got across here to this desk before he collapsed? Well, not quite. You see, Mr. Ritter was closer to Dad than I was, and he caught him as he fell. And uh, who else was here? Uh, nobody. Oh, that is nobody but Hayden. He'd just come in from the rear hallway. What was your father doing when he first showed signs of this, uh, this attack? Well, he just finished writing a letter. He sealed it and gave it to Hayden to mail. Was Hayden here when you came in, or did he come in later? Why, I, uh, I believe he came in later. Uh, yeah, I remember he asked Dad if he'd rung. And yeah, then the letter was all ready to go when Hayden came in, huh? Mm, I think so. Yes, I remember Dad couldn't find a stamp at first, and then he found one right there on the blotter. It... Well, say, somebody's cut a piece of that blotter off. We did. Why? What'd you do that for? We had our reasons. Now let's get back to that night. Whose job is it to keep this desk in order? Uh, fill the inkwells, get paper, pens, and so forth. Why, uh, Hayden always tends to that. He has a special fund he uses to buy supplies with. Uh, stamps and things like that. Oh. He buys stamps, does he? Yeah, sure. Paper and pens and all the things like that. Don't know when he happened to buy supplies last, do you, Carl? No, but uh, you'll find a book in his room where he keeps all his accounts. That ought to tell you. You know where that book is? Mm-hmm, sure. He always keeps it in his desk in his room. Let's go take a look. It's the first room at the right, just back of the stairs. How long has Hayden been with your family, Carl? Mm, I don't know. Seems like as long as I can remember. Make good money? I guess so. I never inquired. What did you and your father quarrel about, son? I'd rather not talk about it. Might help a lot. Mm, here's the room. Where's Hayden now? Well, he went to the mortuary. He's going to the cemetery later. This the desk you spoke about? Mm-hmm, that's the one. It's locked. Well, that's funny. It never has been before that I know of. Nowhere there's a key? No, but... Well, if you want the book, let's break it open. <laughs> After all, it belongs to us. Okay, you pull on the drawer while I pry up on this top. That's it. Oh, here's the book. Let me see it. Hmm. June 10th, one pound package of paper, two dozen envelopes, 25 two cent stamps, 25 ones, one bottle black fountain pen ink. Oh, there are the stamps, right back of that page. <laughs> funny, didn't put them in the desk in the library. Very funny. Mm hmm. Here are 24 two cent stamps and 25 ones. Shall I answer it? Yeah. No, no, wait a minute, I'll get it. Westcott residence. Hey, Sandy, I'm over at Ritter's apartment. Oh, hello, Devlin. Playing detective again, huh? Yeah, say, listen, the switchboard operator says Ritter did get a call Sunday night. Well, does she, he, or it know where it came from? No, but she says she'd know if it was Carl's voice. She's heard it lots of times. Okay, I'll have him talk to her. She can see if it's the voice who called Ritter. Here, Carl. What? Ask for Ritter's apartment and leave a message for him. What for? Never mind, go ahead. Uh, hello? Is Mr. Ritter in? Uh... Well, will you tell him to come over to Mr. Westcott's home right away when he comes in? Give me the phone. Well, how about it, Tommy? She says she's sorry, Sandy, but she's positive that that was not the voice that called Ritter Sunday night. Okay, thanks, Newshound. Now go on back to work. Young Westcott was taken back to headquarters while Sanderson and Ryan again started out to continue their investigation. Parked in the shadows of low-hanging trees, the officers sat in their car watching the Westcott home. Hi, coppers. Where'd you come from? The stork brought me. Don't you ever sleep. Not when the homicide squad is trying to make a murder out of a suicide. Don't talk so loud. This is a stakeout. Oh, goody. I've always wanted to see one. Quiet. There he comes. We'll let him get underway, then tail him. Uh, who's him? You'll find out, reporter. I'll let her coast. Uh, keep the starter from sounding. He's really going places, isn't he? If you ask me, I'd say he was trying to shake you, birds, whoever he is. Yeah, he's just being cagey, in case. Yeah? Well, if you don't get this motor going, your case is going to fold up right in your face. All right, here she goes. This is the part I don't like. Catching the criminal, you mean? Man, well, that is, if he is one. My boy, that's the man who murdered old Westcott. You hope. I know. Hold on, you stop him. So are we. Uh, go on by him, we'll walk back. This is far enough. For the love of Pete, this is a cemetery. Yeah, pretty good place for burying things, don't you think? Listen, it'd be a good idea if we don't do too much talking. It's pretty quiet around here. Hold it. 
There goes our man. It looks like he's got a shovel. Want to rush him? No, no, let him get started. Let him dig a while. Now, Tommy, you go around to the right. Ryan, you take the left side, and I'll get him from the front here. You admit I'm handy, don't you? Yeah, for the time being. Quiet now and watch him. He's tricky. Get him up, fella. Oh, who are you? Officer, what is this? Officers, this is an arrest. Oh, oh no, you don't. Oh, yes, we oh, do. Hold him, Tommy. I got him. That's what I'm doing. Say, get that bottle he's got in his hand. Give me that bottle. Give it to me. Hey, that stuff's hard on your digestion. You mustn't go around drinking stuff like that. Give it to me. Please give it to me. Let me drink it. Get your bracelets on him, Ryan. With pleasure. Hey, Sandy, take a look at this. Yeah? Bag full of currency, isn't it, Tommy? Yeah. Say, how did you know? Well, I had an idea Hayden was our man when I found the combination to that safe in his account book this afternoon. So, you broke into my desk. You got that book? Yeah, Hayden, we got it. You weren't satisfied to steal the money. You thought you saw a chance to pin the murder on two innocent persons. You were mighty careless, though, Hayden. You shouldn't have left those other cyanide-coated postage stamps in your account book. You see, the perforations match the one on the letter Mr. Westcott had just written. You found that letter? Yeah. Under the paper lining your desk drawer. Our chemist tells us that there's enough cyanide on that stamp to kill half a dozen men. But what really started us off was the way you pasted that single stamp on the blotter of Mr. Westcott's desk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was clever, wasn't it? <laughs> that way, I was sure he'd get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got it all right, Hayden. And that 25th stamp is going to hang you. <laughs> In just a moment, Chief Davis will give us additional facts about this case. Speaking of crime, some motor fuels are guilty of treason on the highways because they contribute to the delinquency of your motor. That kind of crime does not pay either. This advertising world is filled with extravagant claims and glowing promises, but you can't fool all the people all the time. As a matter of fact, you can't fool the truly motor-wise any of the time. The officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California know what they're doing when, after putting all motor fuels through their paces... They issue orders that only Rio Grande cracked gasoline shall be used to power their emergency equipment. Drop in at the nearest Rio Grande station. Fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline and you will discover the meaning of real police car performance. And now, Chief Davis. The murderer waived all rights to trial and pleaded guilty to the charges brought against him. He received sentences that kept him in prison until his death a few months ago from an ailment of long standing. Cunning though he was... He was not clever enough to make crime a paying proposition. Thank you, Chief Davis. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 238 regarding a murder. Suspects in this case died in prison. That's all. Rosenquist. Narrator Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Calling all cars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Kern County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 239 regarding a holdup and kidnapping. Suspect described as an American, 5 feet 9 or 10 inches tall. Weight about 150 pounds. Appeared to be a young man. This bandit is armed and dangerous. That's all. Rolls and quit.
Every time you step on the starter, friends, you toss that motor of yours into the ring for a battle royal against the ganged-up forces of friction and wear, egged on by hot summer weather and high speed. And if it has its guard down, as usually is the case when you paint it on the knockout drops of mediocre oil, your motor is going to take it on the chin and be counted out sooner or later. Keep its guard up, friends, with real lube. Teach it to not only block blows, but to fight back, knocking the enemies of motor efficiency right through the ropes in the very first round. With stout-hearted, two-fisted real lube on your side, the battle is won. For this great lubricant never wilts in the heat of the fray, never lets his foes get set for a haymaker, and has never yet lost a decision. Drop around at the red and white Rio Grande station nearest you in the morning and sign up real lube as the bodyguard for your motor. You'll get longer life and liberty in your pursuit of motoring happiness with Rio Lube, with the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. The story we are to hear tonight was taken from the confidential files of the office of Sheriff Ed Champness of Kern County. We have the privilege of having him with us tonight to open our program. Sheriff Champness. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is pleasant to speculate on a cure for crime, but so far nobody has ever found one. I think this program is probably doing as much to bring home the fact that crime is a losing proposition as any other single agency. But for some reason, we have never been able to understand men still think they can beat the game, still think that they can pit their puny wits against a machine designed from the beginning to beat them. Trying to beat the law is like playing a slot machine. The odds are hopelessly against you. You can't win. Our program tonight will show how one man played the game and how he lost. What stakes he did get, I will tell you at the end of the program. In a little town in Illinois, Howard Clinton Owen was growing up. We consider the case of Howard Owen, aged eight, as he enters the kitchen of his home. I want some bread and butter and jam. Well, you just had lunch. Run along now and play. I don't want to play. I want some bread and butter and jam. Well, you can't have it. I'm not going to stop my dishwashing just to wait on you. I know you're not hungry. I am hungry. Who are you yelling at? Hey, you. I want some bread and jam. Well, you just march yourself right outside and play. You wait till I finish my work. Then come in here and ask for it right, and I may give you some bread and jam. I want it now. I don't want to play. I want something to eat. You'll get something you don't want if you keep up that crime. You know your father's trying to sleep. I don't care. I'm hungry. What's all this racket about? Don't you know I'm trying to get some sleep? I don't care. Oh, you don't care? Well, maybe I can change your mind for you. Maybe I can make you care. I'll give you something to yell about. Oh, oh stop that. Stop beating the kid. Do you have to beat on him every time you get near him? Now go on. Get outside and yell your head off. I hate you. I hate you. Get out and shut up. Oh, a fine way to bring up a child. Beat them like he was an animal. I'll make him respect me if I have to beat him half to death. Hmm. A lot of respect he's got for you. You heard what he said, didn't you? He hates you. So what? Well, if he hates you when he's only eight years old, how do you suppose he'll feel when he's 16? Get off the porch. Go out in the yard and play and stop that sniffling. No! Oh, let him alone. What do you expect him to do after that beating you give him? Now, listen, you. You keep out of this. The sooner you make up your mind to conquer that brat's temper, the better off we'll all be. You'll never do it by whipping him. You've tried that ever since he was big enough to walk. And he's worse now than he ever was. Oh! Look out! What was that? Howard threw that rock through the window. He threw that at me? Just wait till I get my hands on him. Frank, wait! Be careful what you do! Come here to me, you. I'll teach you who's the boss. <laughs> Day by day, the Owen home became worse. Howard was a constant source of trouble. At last, in desperation, he was sent east to his grandmother in a small town in upstate New York. Howard, Howard, where are you, Sonny? Here I am, Granny, in the backyard with Johnny. Oh, hello, Johnny. Hello. Sonny, I want you to run over to the grocery and get me some... Why, where is that kitchen? Why, what? Kitten, Granny. The the one that's crying. Is it in... Yes, here it is in the rain barrel. 
Why, the poor little thing's half drowned. I oh, know he ain't, Granny. He's got nine lives, and this is only the first time he's been... Howard told... Owens, did you put this kitten in that rain barrel? Yes, ma'am, he sure did. You shut your mouth, Johnny Walsh. Well, what if I did put him in there? He ain't hurt much. He would have been if I hadn't happened to come out here and pulled him out of that barrel. I can't understand what makes you so cruel, Sonny. Don't you know it's sinful to hurt dumb animals? Ah, oh, it's only a kitten. Well, but it has feelings just the same as you have. You ought to have seen that little girl down at the beach yesterday when Howard came... Cattletail! What about the little girl, Johnny? Well, she was sitting on the sand and her feet were sticking straight out. Better and... look out, Johnny Walsh. Go on, Johnny. Well, a man threw a cigarette away and Howard picked it up and... He, he didn't smoke it, did he? No, ma'am, he... If you tell, I'll fix you. He, he stuck the cigarette to the bottom of the little girl's foot and he burned it. Howard, you didn't. Howard, put that stick down. I told you not to tell hey, you, I Keep away from me now. You won't tell on Don't me you, again, I bet you. Don't you hit me. Howard, oh, stop Ow. it. Do you hear Ow. me? Ow. Stop hitting Ow. Gully with Ow. that stick. Follow me, will you? Don't do it no oh, more. Oh, boys, I won't. Don't. Please don't. Don't. I'll you don't hurt me. You bet you won't do it no Ow. more. Not when don't. I get through with you. <laughs> Three years pass, years filled with escapades of young Howard Owens. Time after time, he is hailed into juvenile court, lectured, released. Time after time, he is sent to schools for wayward boys, but each time he returns, more determined than ever to make life miserable for those around him. Thus, at 15, we find him again in a court of justice. Well, Joe, I see your pet is back again. Oh, you mean that Owens kid? Mm. Yeah, I haven't had trouble with that brat for longer than I can remember. Ten years old when you got him, wasn't he? You mean when I chased him through the park the first time? Mm. Yeah, he was about ten, I guess. Yeah, he's fifteen now. Been in juvenile hall five times since he was twelve. Well, I hope you keep him this time. Yeah, maybe the judge will find some place for him. He's got a burglary charge against him, grand larceny. That ought to hold him a while. Where'd you pick him up? Well, I got a call from one of his neighbors that he was prowling around a garage with another kid. So I drove out there just as they were leaving. Gee, Howard, you sure you can drive this car? Sure, why not? Gee, I'm scared. Ah, you're a sissy. What'd you come with me for if you're yellow? Oh, I ain't yellow. I'm just afraid you can't get the car started. There she goes. What'd I tell you? Gee, this is swell. Say, where are we going? Oh, I don't know. We'll take her out on the pike and open her up. Gee, you're a pretty good driver. Yeah, I told you I knew how to drive. Hey, Howard, there's a car following. It's got a red light. Cops. Hey, well, what are we going to do? Shut up. They ain't caught us yet. Hey, that, that car's gaining. Yeah, well, it'll have to go something to catch this baby. Hey, he, he's sure stepping on it. Yeah, well, so am I. Take a look at that speedometer. Gee, 60... Boy, that's awful fast. Ah, you ain't seen nothing yet. Boy, is this a bus or ain't it? Boy, you're leaving that cop way behind. Look out, we gotta turn. Hey, Howard, you can't make it. I'll you The Owens kid wasn't hurt much, but the other boy's pretty badly banged up. I got to him just after the crash, and Owens put up a tough battle before I could bring him in. Here comes the judge. Maybe he'll put a break on the young hoodlum. Well, young man, have you anything further to say this morning? No. Please, please, judge. Let me have the boy. I'm an old woman. I need him. He'll be a good boy, won't you, Sonny? Ah, stop gabbling. Young man, I've stood about all of your arrogance I intend to. Your grandmother has stood by you from the start of this trial. It's over now. And it's my duty to decide what shall be done with you. Well, get it over with. It is the sentence of this court that you be confined in the state reformatory for a period of not less than one and not more than 20 years. And I hope by the time you finish your sentence that you will have learned your lesson. Oh, don't worry. I'll learn. Plenty. <laughs> be a swell idea if you try to play the game when you get to the school. Yeah? You can get along if you try. Oh, I won't give them no trouble if they don't give me none. But you let them start picking on me and they'll get plenty of it. Make it easy on yourself, kid. I suppose when you get through telling them about me, they'll make it plenty tough. You make your own record. It's not any of my business Magazines, to tell anybody about you. books, magazine, magazine, Sonny. We don't want none. Liberty, Saturday Evening Post. I told you we don't want none. Treasure Island? Here's a nice book for a little fella. The Rover Boys at school. You better peddle your paper somewhere else. Oh, tough, huh? You're just asking for trouble, fella. He talks mighty tough not to be any bigger than he is. Yeah? 
Well, I'm big enough to throw these books out of the window. Like this. But... Hey, cut that out. And these papers. Uh, stop him. And the rest of your junk. That'll cost you plenty, young fella. Yeah, we'll try and get it. Look here, mister. This your kid. Mine. Are you crazy? Well, well, and whose is he? Is he yours, lady? Lord, no. Is this your kid, mister? If he was, I'd wheel the daylights out of him. <laughs> Where's the superintendent's office, Sonny? Right there, first door to the right. Thank you. Come in. Go on, Howard. Oh, well, you're Howard Owen, hmm? Yeah. Yes, what? Just, yeah. Mm hmm. Have a nice trip, Howard? Yeah. We might as well understand each other, Howard. One of the first things we learn here is respect for the law and those who represent it. I represent the law. You'll speak more civilly. Okay. Well, Nelson, why don't you spell now, it? Now, just a minute. Another thing, Howard. We don't carry tales in here. We always let a fellow do his own telling. Well, if you'll just sign the papers, Mr. Johnson, I'll be getting back. All right. There you are. Thank you. Now, Howard, you come along with me. We'll meet some of the boys and see what the cook's got for lunch. Hey, why don't you eat your soup, fella? None of your business. Well, what are you looking at it for? Is there something wrong with it? Let me alone, will you? I'm thinking. Yeah? Well, if you'd have done that before, you wouldn't be here. Yeah? They don't like me here. These guys are all looking at me funny-like. Johnson don't like me either. He thinks I got a bad record. They think I'm going to make trouble. They want to get rid of me. Look at that soup. Them black specks is poison. Yeah, that's it. They're trying to poison me. Well, they ain't going to get away with it. They ain't going to get away with it. They ain't. They ain't going to get away with it. I told them they can't poison me. Hey, what's the idea of turning the table over? Look what you've done to my pants. Well, they're trying to poison me. Oh, you're nuts. I'm not nuts. They're trying to kill me, I tell you. Oh, shut up. I won't shut up. You can't make me shut up. I ought to give you a poke in the kisser. Well, go on. Try it. Start something. Hey, fella. Come on. Let's teach this smart kid a lesson. Yeah, come on, that kid. Twenty-seven months later, Howard Clinton Owens again stood in the office of the superintendent of the state reformatory. Well, Owens, the board has acted favorably on your parole. You're to be released today. Is that so? You've been a problem, Owens. I don't mind telling you that. Hmm, thanks, warden. I wasn't even trying. I'm a superintendent of this school, Owens, not a warden. Well, what's the difference? It's still a jail to me. Have it your way. I don't suppose you've learned much since you've been here. That's what you think. Now, this is the finest training school I could have asked for. I know my way around now. Around? Yeah. I know how to wire around the ignition of an automobile any time I want a car. I know how to get the combination off a safe. And just how to jimmy a window without leaving a mark. I'm smart, see? Yes, I do see. And besides that, I know just how hard to sock a dame so she won't squawk while you're getting her purse. And just how hard to squeeze a bird's Adam's apple to cut off his wind without killing him. That is, if you don't want to kill it. And, uh, you learned all that here, did you? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, most of it. Of course, I... Note a few things when I come here. But not much about the more refined sort of crime. Listen, Warden. The world owes me for all the years I put in this stinking joint, see? And all them other times I was in jail when I was a kid. I'm going to get paid for all that time, Warden, get me? Well, when you were a kid, what, what do you think you are now? I'm dry behind the ears. Now, the thought of working. Work? <laughs> that don't make me laugh. Well, why should I work? It's too easy to get along without it. I know, see? I've been to the state's very best reformatory. I'm finishing school today. Graduate. Yes, Owens, you are. And at the rate you're going, you'll enroll immediately in some penitentiary for a course of postgraduate work. Mm, that a boy, Warden. That's the spirit. Well, I'll be seeing you in church. <laughs> <laughs> Less than a month later, Owens was arrested in Miami, Florida on suspicion of having committed a felony. He was released for lack of evidence. Six months later, a bank in Georgia was robbed of $3,000. The description of the bandit tallied with that of Howard Owens. Then the young criminal dropped from sight. Had he met his match in some quick-fingered law enforcement officer? Had he at last reformed? Was he serving a sentence in some remote prison? Where was Howard Clinton Owens?
Red dust swirled behind a heavy sedan that slid to a stop in front of a bank in a small Oklahoma town. Two well-dressed young men sauntered into the bank. I'd like to get in the vernacular of the street, my friend, this is a stick-up. Oh, what? Well, come on, get into the vault, all of you. Oh, you customers, too. Yes. You'll get caught robbing banks, young man. Yeah, that'll be too bad, madam, and you'll get shot if you don't do just what I tell you. Now move. That's it. Back in there, all of you. Come on, close the door, Sam. Okay, Sam, let's get going. You take that cage, and I'll take this one. Okay, hon. Easy going, eh? I told you it'd be a cinch. I got about two grand out of that cage. Yeah, and I got three out of mine. Nice pay for five minutes' work. Yeah, not bad. Let's see now. That ought to pay for the first year I spent in the reformatory. Five days later, two young men walked into the American bank at Covington. We're taking charge of this bank. Into that vault, all of you. Yes, sir. Put the money in this sack, guy. That is the bank's money. We don't want any of that that belongs to widows and orphans. Just what the bank owns and what's insured. Look at them birds, Howard. They're so scared they can't talk. Yeah, yeah, I've been like that a lot of times myself. See what's in the cabinet, Sam. Okay. Hey, look, rifles and a pack of rods. Yeah, bring them along. Lock that vault door first. I already locked it. Now, let's walk, not run to the nearest exit. Right with you, kid. How much? Oh, about six grand. Uh, that's about another year at the state's finishing school paid for. Gee, boss, you sure keep your head on these jobs. Yeah. Well, we're going to need some cool thinking. How come? We're going to have every copper in this state after us before we know it. Owens was right. Within a quarter of an hour, radio, telephone, and teletype had carried a description of the bandits to every peace officer within a hundred miles of the robbery. Owens and his companion were now definitely identified. All roads were watched. Armed men waited patiently in remote sections of the country, watching every passing car. On a highway near Salisaw, Oklahoma, a group of deputies sat in their parked car, scrutinizing the passing traffic. Doesn't look like we're going to find the boys tonight. Yeah, beginning to look that way. Now, you fellas all know what to do if we spot them. Sure, sure, brother. Yeah. We'll get out in the road and stop them, and you boys keep your guns on them, and a couple of us will take them. Say, that might be them now. Where? Right down the road there. See that car come? That's them. Get going, boys. Well, they see us all right. They're stopping. Cover them, boys. All right, you mavericks. Reach for the sky. We got you covered. Oh, yeah? How do you like this, coppers? <laughs> Let them have it, boys. They've got rifles. That's a cinch to hold up those cops with those rifles. Blast them, you dope. What do you think of doing? Why, you couldn't hit a barn if you was inside it. Boy, I got that copper that time. Oh, boy. Look out, you dope. Keep your head down. Oh, oh, they hit me hard. Oh, help me, help hard. Oh, nuts, you. I told you to keep your head down. Oh, help hard. Help me, help me. Go on, get out of here. I ain't wasting my time with no deadhead. On October 7th, 1935, a young man drove an automobile into a service station in Santa Ana, California. Good evening, sir. Fill her up? Not quite. Just act natural and nothing's going to happen to you. Uh, uh, y- y- yes, sir. And keep your hands down and don't give any sign of what's happening. In case you're worried about it, this bulge in my pocket is a gun, and I know how to use it. That's, that's all right. I'll take your word for it. Now get inside and close the door. Now let's have what's in the till and make it snappy. Okay. Now turn off the lights. What's the big idea? You'll find out. Get going. What are you going to do? I'll just keep quiet for a few minutes and get in the car. Okay, mister, this is the end of the line for you. Get out. Yes, sir. And keep your mouth shut, or I'll come back and shut it for keeps. Good evening. I'm the new collector. I want that money you got. Say, wait a minute. We don't deliver our money to anybody we don't know. That's so? Well, maybe you know this guy in my pocket better. His name is Colt. You ever hear of him? Oh, stick up, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. You catch on quick. Okay, you can relax. It's inside in a tilt. What an unusual place to keep money. Move. Oh, take it easy, fella. I'm nervous, pal, and my fingers twitch when I get nervous. Now get that jack. All right. Here you are, buddy. 
pretty slim pickings for the chance you're taking. Mister, I don't take chances. Get started. You're going for a ride. Oh, n- n- now listen, fella. I was just kidding. Look, look, guy. I got a wife and a kid. I won't squawk to the cops. Honestly. Nah, ain't that tough. Go on. Get in that car. No, no. No, wait a minute. That's a better car parked on the grease rack. Yeah, yeah, but that's a, that's a customer's so car. So what? Get in it. What are you going to do with me? I haven't decided yet. Don't talk so much. Now, look. You could rip out the phone and I couldn't call anybody till you had a chance to get away. It's you that needs a chance, buddy. Not me. Just sit still and hang on. We're going places. It's as far as you go. Scram. Hey, what's the idea? This is ten miles from town. I said scram. And when I say scram, I don't want any guys hanging around. Kern County Sheriff's Office calling all cars. Attention all city and highway patrol cars. Be on the lookout for an unmasked bandit. Drive a 1935 Buick sedan. Dark green... Chrome wheel. This car stolen in Los Angeles estate. The holdup man also robbed and kidnapped the filling station attendant. Victim badly beaten and can give no description of bandit. Man is believed to be about 23 or 24 years old. Medium build. Exercise caution in apprehending this man. He is armed and dangerous. Within a few hours after his victim had been left unconscious beside the highway, Howard Owens was speeding along the road near Bakersfield. Alert officers and highway patrolmen watched every passing car hoping to encounter the bandit. Near the Bakersfield city limits, two city officers, Jim Brady and John Lonsbury, wait in their car. Yeah, there's nothing I like better than chasing tough guys driving high-powered cars. Yeah, I'm crazy about it, too. Especially when you have to puncture a gas tank and get a face full of tetraethyl. Hey, quiet a minute. I hear a siren. Maybe Minter and Walker spotted a speeder. I see his red light. John, look. It's a Buick. That's our man, all right. Here we go, boy. Hang on. Boy, this will be good if we do it. This will be a good trick if we didn't do it. Minter's sure riding that guy. And how? Better hit that siren a time or two. Hold on, John. If he made that turn, we can. Oh, it's things like this that make me wish I was back on the ranch. Yeah, we let this bird get away and we'll both be there. Whoa, this is a dead-end street. There's the Buick. There's Minter. Hey, Toby, where'd he go? I see him. But again, Howard Owens outshot the law and outran his pursuers. Dodging in and out of freight cars, over moving trains through irrigation ditches, Owens escaped. Brady and Lounsbury returned to the police headquarters. A few minutes later, at the Kern County Sheriff's Office, the phone rings. Sheriff's office, Lyon speaking. Uh, hello, this is George Cooper. I've just been held up. Where? Right in front of my house. A young fellow with a gun took my car and drove off with it. Uh, which way did he go? He, he went uh, west. How long ago was this? About ten minutes. Okay, we'll get right on it. Hey, Jensen, Roberts, Bardot, McMahon. That Los Angeles bandit just held up George Cooper, stole his car, and headed west on Chester Avenue. Go get him! Officers immediately started a search for the young bandit, but meantime, he had wrecked the stolen automobile and within a few moments managed to steal another car and continue on his way. Balked at every turn, the officers continued their search. Surrounding counties were warned to be on the lookout for the criminal. Meantime, word came that another service station had been held up and robbed and the attendant kidnapped. Every officer in Sheriff Champlin's office was placed on duty in an effort to apprehend the fugitive. Then, in the early evening of the following day, word came that Owens had been sent seen in fellows. Deputies Act Jensen, Bardo, McMahon, and Roberts immediately rushed to that small community. Eck, I'm going to park the car on that hill right over there and keep a watch on this house where the constable said this monkey was supposed to be hiding. I can see the house and most of the town from there. If he comes out this side, I'll keep my spotlight on and you fellows take him. Okay. McMahon and I'll take the other side of this joint and keep an eye out for him. If he's in there... He'll be coming out. Okay. Be careful, though. He's dangerous. Where'd you get the tip this guy was out here? Len Roberts and I came out here this morning looking for him. Told the constable to keep watching for the bird. Huh? Sometime this afternoon, the constable saw him. 
But our hold-up artist was a little too quick for him and got away. So they think he's in that house, huh? Yeah. He stole a car off a parking lot in Bakersfield. Yeah, I know about that. That's the car parked in the backyard there. If he tries to make a break for it, we'll nab the hey, gentleman. Hank, huh? look. There's a man coming down the stairs at the back of that house. That's our man. I'd bet my head on it. You want to take him now? No, no. We'll be sure. Well, we'll fool around and let him get away. Again. No, we won't. Come on. Hey, you! Come down from there. Next to you, copper! <laughs> Leave him have it, Mac. He'll he get away, Hack. Then will get it. Don't shoot! Sounds like Glenn spotted him. You got me. Don't shoot! Don't kill me! I admit it. I wasn't shooting sure at you fellas. Honest, don't kill me. I'm hit! Hold it, Glenn. We got him. Please don't shoot me. Please don't. Oh, pipe down. Please Stop your sniveling. We're not going to hurt you. Please don't. Please don't. You know, Mac, someday I'm going to stick a pin in one of these tough guys... And I'll bet my hat he'll bleed lemon juice. In just a moment, Sheriff Chaffness will give us the concluding facts of our program. Remember the old iron bridge that used to span the river in your hometown? And the sign printed on it which read... Five dollars fine for driving faster than a walk. How times have changed. Nowadays, we say... Real Grande Cracked is fine for any kind of driving, fast or slow. And that, friends, is putting it mildly. The rest of the story is that Real Grande Cracked is the gasoline that goes in the tanks of the cars that track down the enemies of society and catch them. Not only does this finer motor fuel power more police cars and more fire engines, ambulances, and other life and death automotive equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand, but Rio Grande Cracked is the gasoline upon which a preponderance of California state and federal government officials depend to speed their emergency cars on their ways more swiftly, surely, and economically. Are you one of the tens of thousands of motorists benefiting by this great gasoline? If not, be up to date. Be thrifty. It will cost you less in the smooth, long run to get Rio Grande cracked and enjoy the police car performance of this, the most highly acclaimed gasoline in the West. And now, Sheriff Chambers. The captured man was Howard Owens. He had not been wounded, but like all criminals of his type, he turned yellow when cornered. Brought to my office, he not only confessed his California activities to me, but bragged about his many criminal escapades. He was tried separately for all his crimes committed in Southern California and is now serving six separate sentences in Folsom Prison. His is another life of crime that has failed to pay. Thank you, Sheriff Champness. Kern County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars to cancellation broadcast 239 regarding a holdup and kidnapping. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quest. Narrator Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for re- Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling All Cars, attention All Cars, broadcast 240 at Beechwood and Sunset to see the officer. That's all, Rose and Quest. A few days hence, and we shall celebrate the 162nd anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And you know, friends, one of the sanest ways to observe the Fourth is to visit some section of this great country of ours that you've never seen before. Three forms of accidents can mar the happiness of the day. 
One of these can be avoided by careful driving, another by careful use of fireworks, and the other by giving your motor the protection it needs with sturdy Realube motor oil. This great lubricant is manufactured in the country's largest refinery and so made that it cannot break down under the pressure of blistering hot weather. Friends, if you've been experimenting with wishy-washy oils to let your motor down at the least provocation, declare your independence right now, and before you set out on any trip, roll into the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood and declare your allegiance to Rio Lube, the newest and finest motor oil in the West. The story we are here tonight has been taken from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. We have therefore asked Chief of Police James E. Davis to open our program. Chief Davis. If all the people who come to Hollywood to break into the movies wouldn't, there'd be a lot more happiness all around. It has always been a mystery to me how anyone in his right mind will allow himself to be sold so completely by a spurious producer that he will part with his hard-earned money in the happy hope that he will someday be a big shot in the movies. One of the most constantly recurring problems the police have to deal with is that of some unsuspecting person letting his life savings go to some unscrupulous but smooth-tongued promoter. The case we are about to hear is one in point. Even though the criminal in this case was caught and punished, the fact remained that a lot of people would have been better off if they had stayed away from Hollywood. However, the program was waiting. I'll be with you again at the end of the show. In a little bungalow in Hollywood's movie section, a man and a woman have just finished breakfast. He reads the morning paper. Listen, Bob, before you turn to the funny paper, you better look under the want ads for a job. Say, who do you think I am? I can't land a job the week after we arrive in California. Well, no one expects you to, silly. But we ought to be thinking about it. $400 is all there is between us and the poorhouse. Well, I'm not Lou Ayers. I'm Bob James. I can't crash the movies overnight. Neither can you. Well, that's what I've been saying all along. We'll have to take whatever jobs we can get until we can make the studios. Well, that's what I'm hunting for. Let me have some of the paper. Wait a minute. Here, listen to this, will you? I'm listening. Wanted. Assistant director. $45 per week salary. Small investment required. Secured and returnable. Call at stage nine. Mark Ree Studios. Sunset Boulevard in Beechwood. Assistant director? Gee, that's too good to be true. Why, if you could only land something like that, we'd be all well, set. Don't forget there'll be a hundred others after it. And we don't know what they call a small investment in the movies. Well, I know it, but there's no harm in looking into it. And we better get busy on it right away before the rush starts. Well, I'll get ready and go right out there now. Say, what'll you tell them if they ask you if you've ever had any experience as a director? I'll leave it to me, kid. I'll bluff my way through somehow. <laughs> yes, that's how you got me. Huh? Well, you can tell them you've played stock all through the Middle West and still be telling the truth. Don't forget, I helped direct some of those shows. Besides, they don't want a guy who's had too much experience or he'd be running the works. They want an assistant director. Yeah, that's right. And once you get in, you can pull wires and get me in the picture. Honey, you talk like I have that job. But one thing's sure, it's only in Hollywood one had stumbled on an ad like this. Or an opportunity like this. After all, that's what we came here for. And so did a thousand of others. Well, I thought I've got a hunch you're going to be the one that's chosen. Oh, cut out the pep talk. And you get shaved and go right over there now, will you? Good morning. Is Mr. Becker in? Oh, good morning, Mr. James. You are Mr. James, aren't you? Yes, I, I phoned for an appointment just a little while ago. Mr. Becker's expecting me. Oh, yes, I, I know. Uh, he wasn't expecting you so soon, though. Is he here? Yes, but he's in conference right now. Won't you wait? Uh, yes, if you don't mind. Mr. Becker's a very busy man. So it seems. Yes, sir? Oh, yes, Mr. Becker. There's a gentleman waiting to see you. Yes, Mr. James. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. James, Mr. Becker will see you now. First door to the right. Thanks. You've got a lot of trick locks around this place. Oh, yes. We have to be careful. Come right in, Mr. James. Come right in. I'm awfully glad you could come over. Oh, excuse me a moment, will you? Certainly. Miss Harmon, get me Mr. Fairbanks, will you? Yes, at his home. He'll find the number in my private file out there. Yes, thank you. Now, Mr. James, what can I do for you? Well, I, I saw your ad in the paper this morning... So I phoned your secretary for an appointment. Well, here I am. Mm -hmm. So you think you'd like to be an assistant director, do you? 
You know anything about the moving picture business? Well, no, sir. That's I... fine. Fine. Then I can train you just the way I want you. I'm looking for a man who can start in here at the mud salary at first and learn the business from the ground up. Here, have a cigar. Thank you. You, uh, say you've had no experience in pictures. Hmm? No, sir. Most of my work's been in stock in the Middle West. Mm-hmm. And how long have you been in California? Well, just a couple of weeks. I thought I might as well join the mob. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nothing ventured, nothing gained. You know how it is. Yes? Oh, fine, fine. Put him on. It's fair, man. Hello, Doc. How's the boy? That's good. Oh, how's Mary? Fine. Oh, Doug, I called about the release of Around the World in 80 Minutes. I'm afraid we can't handle it on the basis we discussed. No. No, I don't feel that 500000 is enough to guarantee us a profit. Now, if we could make a deal whereby we could get, uh, oh, say, 100000 cash and release the picture on a 50-50 basis, yes, then maybe we could get together. That is, providing we can shoot some additional scenes to improve the continuity of the picture. Yes. Oh, Doug, I'll tell you what. Suppose we talk this over at lunch, eh? Say, uh, one o'clock at the Derby? <laughs> Swell, I'll see you then. Oh, Doug, tell Mary hello for me, will you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye. Fine fellow, Doug Fairbanks. You know him that well? Why, sure. I've known him for years. Used to be his business manager, and then I took over production for him. Gee. Oh, he's just one of many, one of many. Take Jack Barron, for instance. Why, he couldn't get to first base till I took him over. I made him the star he is today. Is that so? Yes, sir. He came out here from a little town in the Middle West. He was broke, didn't know a soul in Hollywood. That was ten years ago. Now look at him. He's really on top, all right. I gave him his start, gave him his first break. It's all and who you know out here, my boy. What you can do doesn't make much difference if you can't get a chance to prove it, you know. Gee, I didn't realize I was going to get to see a real big shot in the movies when I came in here. Ah, uh, yes. But Jeanette Gaynor's my real find. That girl had never seen a camera until I put her in front of one. Oh, what do you know about that? From the looks of all these pictures, she isn't the only one. No, not by a long shot. But I have a soft spot in my heart for Jeanette. Oh, by the way, she's coming in to see me this morning. I guess I'll stick around. <laughs> yes, I would too, if I were you. Oh, you uh, might be interested in reading some of the autographs on these pictures. Well, that's what I've been doing. Here, why don't you read this one? All that I am and hope to be, I owe to my best friend and pal, Jack Becker. Good luck always, Jack Barron. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't take a million dollars for that, man. I guess not. What does this one say? To the ace, Jack Becker from the deuce, Rex Champion. That's a honey. <laughs> Just like Rex, the old <laughs> son of a gun. <laughs> to my loving brother, Jack. The best brother a girl could ever have. All my love, your sister, Marion. So Marion Dixon's your sister? Wait till I tell my wife. Marion's her favorite actress. Yep, Marion's my kid sister, all right. Used to see her fan mail for just one day. You know, I carried her in my arms the first time that kid was ever on a set. On the old B&E lot, that Don't was. say. She's tops now, all right. It's easy how, to figure how she got there. Yeah, she's got what it takes, too. I could spend a whole day here reading all these swell things they've written about you. <laughs> That's what everybody who comes in here says. Oh, but <laughs> heading down to business again. We have a large studio here. We're working day and night. And we need another assistant director. I was afraid you'd engaged one by this time. Well, we're not jumping at the first applicant by any means. We know what we want, and we're using this means of making our selection. Oh, yes. So far, I haven't interviewed anyone I can conscientiously recommend for the job. Well, I'd just about give my right eye for this opportunity. I don't know that I've had all the experience you're looking for, but if I had the chance, I know I'd make good. I've always admired folks who have confidence in themselves and scorn those who are overly confident. Mr. Becker, if you'll give me this one chance... Well, I could just be your right arm around here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. James. You impress me very favorably. You come back after lunch uh, with the uh, $200, and we'll go into the details. And if everything's mutually satisfactory, we might be able to get together on this. Hmm? I don't know what to say, Mr. Becker. That's all right, son. That's all right. I'll prove to you in no time that your judgment is right again. Mm -hmm. And your money will be secured and returnable after faithful performance of your contract. The uh, salary is small for a starter, but if you get going, it shoots up like a skyrocket in this business. I'll be satisfied if I can just go up. The skyrocket part can wait. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes? Oh, well, tell Mr. Navarro I'll see him in a few minutes. Some kid who thinks he's an actor wants to get into pictures, but he hasn't got what it takes. I can't be wasting my time on him. I'm glad you didn't feel that way about me. Oh, I can tell a winner when I see one, my boy. We'll go places in this racket. Racket? Uh, 
<laughs> we uh, always refer to the picture business as a racket, just the figure of speech, you know. Oh, yes. Well, I'll see you this afternoon, Bobby, my boy. <laughs> Meantime, in the studio, Becker was interviewing other applicants for the job of assistant director. Now, Mr. Salazar, you come around the morning with your money, and we'll sign the contract. And I'll really be an assistant director? Absolutely. You string along with me, my boy, and we'll go places in this racket. That's splendid, Mr. Stanley. Splendid. Five hundred will be just about right. Now, here's your contract. Just sign right there. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's it. Fine. And this makes me an assistant director? Absolutely. My boy, you string along with me and we'll go places in this racket. That's fine, Miss Golden, fine. Just sign right here. Thank you. Now, here's your receipt for $200 and your contact. We'll start shooting next Monday. I'll make you uh, an actress, Miss Golden. You just string along with me. Then followed weeks of inactivity. With the studio cluttered with assistant directors, no money for salaries, there came the inevitable dissatisfaction. At last, fully convinced that Becker meant to defraud his many assistants, one of the victims reported to the bunko squad of the police department. I'm Lieutenant Swan. I believe you've got something you think ought to be investigated. Yes, sir. I didn't want to say anything about it before, but several things have happened that make me think something's wrong. Maybe you better tell me all about the case. Well, in the first place, my husband answered an ad in one of the newspapers several weeks ago. Just what kind of an ad? Well, here it is. I kept a copy of it. Thank you. Business opportunities. Wanted assistant director. Salary. Small investment, secured and returnable. Yeah, I've heard about this one before. You have? Sure. These things are all fakes. No legitimate studio ever advertises this way. And besides, you don't have to buy a job in Hollywood or anywhere else. But my husband had to put up $200 to get his job. How much was the salary? Forty dollars a week, I think. Has he collected it regularly? No, that's the point. That's why I thought something was wrong. He hasn't collected a cent. Mr. Becker told him that his salary would start when he started work on a picture. But they haven't started. I was supposed to work on the picture, too. Your husband hired you? No, sir. Mr. Becker did. I invested fifty dollars myself. Does your husband know this? No. I didn't think it was a good idea to tell him. Why not? Well, I didn't want him to worry about my not working, too, and... Well, Mr. Becker doesn't know we're married to each other. How long have you been waiting for this job? Well, almost a month now. I tried to see Mr. Becker last week, but he wouldn't see me. That's natural. Did you phone him? Yes, but his secretary said he was out. Yeah, that's the usual procedure. Well, you see, I was afraid to let Mr. Becker think I was mad because of what he might do to my husband. Have you had any other trouble with Becker? Well, when I went in to see him the first time, he asked me a few questions, and, and then he tried to get fresh, and I put him in his place, and... Well, I never did get in the studio after that, though I did talk to him a time or two on the phone. Do you think there's any chance of getting my money back? About one chance in 50,000. The same thing goes for your husband. Now, you take my advice and tell him all about this. And tell him to start looking for another boss, because the one he's got is going to jail. Next morning, the Mark Free Studios received an apparently prosperous but obviously suburban visitor. How do you do, ma'am? My name's Swan. I'd like to see the man that runs this place. You mean Mr. Becker? Well, I don't know who he is. It just says, see somebody here at this studio. What says that? Well, this here ad. I clipped it out of the paper this morning. Oh, I see. You want to be an assistant director? Well, I don't know about that, but I am looking for a job and anything will do. You're um, able to... Uh qualify for the job? Well, I haven't had much experience, but I'm willing to learn. <laughs> that wasn't exactly what I meant. I meant the uh, investment part. Oh, that. Oh, sure. I can do that all right. Do you, do you think a couple of thousand would be enough? A couple of thousand? Yes, ma'am. That's all I brought with me this morning. Maybe I could raise a little more by noon. Oh, I, I think that'll be quite adequate. Just sit down, will you? Mr. Becker will see you right away, I'm sure. I'll be right back. Don't go away. Oh, don't worry. I'm not easy to do. What's the big idea, Miss Harmon? I told you I couldn't pay your salary today. Now stop bursting in here like that. Can't you see I'm busy? It's not my salary, Mr. Becker. Well, what in blaze it is it then? It's a man. His name's Swan. Well, what about him? He's got money. Money? Lots of it. Two thousand dollars. Two thousand? Well, what are you standing there for? Two thousand dollars. Get him in here. Go on. Get him in here. Quick. Two thousand dollars. Well, there ain't that much money. Oh, 
Come in, come in, sit down, have a cigar. Yes, sir, thank you. So, you're interested in becoming an assistant director, are you, Mr. Swan? Very much so. That is, if the investment isn't too steep. Well, what would you call steep? Well, all we have in the world is four thousand dollars. Four thousand. <laughs> you're safe then. You're safe as far as the investment is concerned. I mean, <laughs> we're not really interested in that. It's just a guarantee of good faith more than anything. I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you had any experience in pictures? Not out here in California. My work was on a stock farm back home. Oh. But there was a movie company came through there once, and they wrote a swell part for me. They did. Yeah, I was a uh, uh, extra. Oh, fine, fine. And uh, how long have you been in California? Oh, just a short time. We decided to take our chances with the other 999. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained, you know. (laughs) Now, uh, getting back to this job. We have a large studio here working day and night. We need another assistant director. And so far, I haven't interviewed anyone I can recommend for the job. Well, I'd give him a right eye almost for this opportunity. I'll tell you, Mr. Swan, you impress me very favorably. Yes, very favorably. You come back after lunch with the uh, $2,000, and we'll go into the details. And we may be able to get together on this. Gosh, I I don't know exactly what to say, Mr. Becker. I'm sort of bowled over. That's all right, my boy. That's all right. And your money is safe. It's secured and returnable in three months, provided you fulfill your end of the contract. Well, I'll do my best, Mr. Becker. Yes, I'm sure you will. You string along with me, my boy, and you'll go far in this racket. Racket? (laughs) Just a figure of speech, my boy, just a figure of speech. We all have them out here. Oh, well, uh, when do I start to work, Mr. Becker? Right today, right now, uh, when you fade over the 2,000. Well, I'll have it for you this afternoon. Lieutenant Swan returned to headquarters, reported to his superior officer, and arranged for a certified check for $2,000. Armed with this, he returned to the studio where preparations had been made to impress the new assistant director. Now you all know what to do. This bird has 2,000 bucks with him, and he's got two more where that came from. If I can get my hands on that, we're all out in the open from here on in. Now, he's due here in about two minutes. So get on your toes. Let him have it for all your work. You understand? Yes, okay. Yes? Okay, send him in. Here comes the sucker. Now get set. No, no, Jack. I will not do it. I will go home. But, Greta, you can't do this to me. Think of what we've done together. Think of the plans I've got for your future, Greta. Future, future. You talk of my future when my heart is breaking. No, I cannot stand this Hollywood another day. I must go home. I want my Sweden with its fjords. That's Norway, you dope. Dope? Dope. That's all I hear in Hollywood. First this one takes it, then it's somebody else. I can't stand it. I thank I go home. Oh, Marlena, you do something with her. What can I do? She won't even speak to me. Every night I meet her at some nightclub, and even then she won't speak to me. That is not true, Marlena. I love you. It is only for the newspapers that we do this. Well, if you ask me, I'd say both of you is loco. Me, I long for the open range, the plain country. Oh, give me a home where the antelopes roam. It's buffaloes, Mr. Maynard. Now, let's stop all this nonsense. (laughs) Oh, how do you do, Mr. Swan? I didn't see you. Well, I... I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, not at all, not at all. Come right in, come right in. Here you are. (laughs) You uh, know Miss Garbo, of course. No, I don't believe I do. How do you do? Are you alone? Alone? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm alone. Good. I wish I were. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Miss Dietrich, may I present Mr. Swan? He's my new assistant. How do you do? Hiya, ma'am. He's such a nice assistant, Mr. Becker. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you've been out here long, Miss Dietrich? Why, this is Marlena Dietrich, Mr. Swan. It is? Yes. Are you interested in pictures, too? I am pictures, Mr. Swan. Oh, you are. I see. I'm sorry. I mean, oh, well, that's right nice. Howdy, partner. I'm Ken Maynard. I'm glad to know you. Well, howdy. We're right glad to have you around this here ranch, partner. We've been needing some new blood around here. 
Just like I told Jack here. What we need on this range is some new blood. Hey, didn't I see that, Jack? That's right, Ken. That's right. You sure did. Well, I've sure seen a lot of your pictures, Mr. Maynard. That's so? Well, I've made a lot. Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, we're going to start shooting today on a new picture of Ken. It's got music, too, Mr. Swan. We've got an exclusive contract with one of the leading acts on the radio, Jimmy and his saddle pal. Why don't we take Mr. Swan out to the ranch and let him get started with us? Why, that's a capital idea, Ken. Come on, let's all go. Morning, Mr. Becker. Good morning, Mr. Becker. Morning, Mr. Becker. Morning, Mr. Becker. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Everything ready? Uh, yes, Mr. Becker. Yes, Mr. Becker. Yes, Mr. Becker. Yes, Mr. Becker. That's fine, that's fine. Come on, Ken, come on, let's get going. Uh, right with you, partner. Come along, Mr. Swan. Right with you, partner. The uh, sound ready? Yeah, okay. That's fine. Where are the saddle pals? Anybody seen the saddle pals? Right here, Mr. Becker. Over here, Mr. Becker. Right here, Mr. Becker. Yeah, over here, Mr. Becker. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> My, what a splendid group of young men. Mm-hmm. Well, you boys ready? Ready. Yes, sir. Well, where's Charlie? Where's Charlie? Anybody see Mr. Wilkes? Where's Charlie Wilkes? All yourself together, Jack. I'm here. What's eating you? Oh, well, there you are. <laughs> you are, aren't you? Of course you are. <laughs> well, well, shall we start? Yeah, might as well. Heard him in, boy. Oh, uh, that'll be part of your job, Mr. Swan. What will? Well, you're an assistant director, you know. Well, who are all these other fellows? Oh, them? Uh, why, <laughs> why, they're assistants, too. Did they put in two thousand dollars too? Why, uh, <laughs> no, no, not quite. They're not such big uh, investors as you are, Mister Swan. <laughs> oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> now, Bob, take a run down the road and stop traffic when we give you the signal. Place is everybody. I'll explain the scene to you. Can you come in from the right? Sit down there on the wagon tongue, Miss Golden. You lean back against the wheel on Kim's lift. You cowboys, drape yourself around the two of them, and when I signal you, it starts your song. Got it? Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. Mr. Wilson. Well okay for sounds. Okay. Roll them. Feet. Well, partner, we've had a tough day today, but it was worth it. Every doggone maverick in the outfit's done rounded up and branded. Let's celebrate. <laughs> Let's have a song, man. Okay, Ken. Let's go, fellas. There's nowhere to go and there's nothing to do. I'm just a happy rolling cowboy. Let me ride that long trail down to the end where the skies are always blue. Hear my song as I ride along. I'm just a happy rolling cowboy. Herding the dark clouds out of the sky, keeping the heavens blue. I ain't got a wife to bother my life, I'm just a happy rolling cowboy. Let me make my bed where the varmint prowl beneath the skies of blue. Hear my song as I ride along, I'm just a happy rolling cowboy. Herding the dark clouds out of the sky, keeping the heavens blue. Got a time just for spending my time. I'm just a happy rolling cowboy. Let me sing my song till they call me home to the land beyond the blue. Hear my song as I ride along. I'm just a happy rolling cowboy. Herding the dark clouds out of the sky, keeping the heavens blue. That's the stuff, boys. That's the sort of thing that makes the old West what she is today. Cut. Cut, that's enough. Wrap them up. Let's be getting back home. Looks like rain. Yeah, kind of does at that, don't it? You can can the Western twang, Joe. We're through. What did he say? Oh, just an expression of his, you know. We all have them out here. <laughs> was that all there is to it? Why, certainly. I told you it was simple. Yeah, it is at that. <laughs> oh, Charlie! Yeah, what is it now? You better do it again. I didn't have the microphone plugged in. Next morning, as Lieutenant Swan arrives at the studio, still posing as the farm boy, awed by the big city, he walks into the outer office in time to hear a conversation coming to the open door of Becker's office. Mr. 
Inspector, I'm behind in my room and board, and I, I wonder if you can't let me have some of the salary you owe me. Why, baby, tomorrow you can have it all. And here's a couple of bucks until then. Oh, thank you. I don't like to ask my grandmother for any more money. You stick with me, honey, and Grandma will be asking you for money. I'm not training you to be just a secretary, you know. You're going to be an actress. Oh, by the way, how are you going to make love on the screen if you don't get a little practice with your boss? Oh, please, Mr. Becker, I I'd rather not talk about that. Well, you like me just a little bit, don't you, baby? Don't touch me, please. Oh, well, I'm please, not going to hurt you. Come on, baby. Come no, on. Be please, reasonable. Don't. Come no. on. Big shot. Huh? What's that? How did you get in here? Your girl Friday left the door open. Well, get out of here. Now, is that any way to talk to an assistant director? You're no assistant director. You're just a... Police officer to you, Becker. Police? Yeah, ever hear of them? Why, you dirty double-crossing... Oh, guy. take it easy, Becker. How many assistant directors have you got around here? Just one. Well, I met five yesterday. Well, that's a lie. Where do you keep the money you swindle these boys out of? I don't know what you're talking about. What did you have to pay those extra girls for posing as stars? You can't talk to me this way. Oh, I... is that so? Say, have you got any contracts around here? Why, oh, no, I have not. I, uh, you... Yeah, just as I thought. Boy, you've really been cleaning up around here, haven't you? Come along, Becker. You're going to the station. All right, pal, but wait a minute. I haven't had any breakfast. I, I haven't even shaved yet. That's all right. The state of California is going to feed you for a long time. And where you're going, shaves don't matter. Move! In just a moment, you will hear Chief Davis. Friends, some motorists are just as gullible as Bob James and his pretty young wife when it comes to investing their hard-earned money in gasoline. The result is they are bunkoed out of the maximum efficiency and economical transportation they might have enjoyed. In the case of Rio Grande Cracked, however, you have this reassuring knowledge that police authorities already have investigated and tested this motor fuel, that Rio Grande Cracked is the overwhelming choice of city and county officials that this great gasoline powers more public-serving police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and the automotive equipment of California state and federal governments wherever it is sold than any other brand. We invite you, too, to investigate and make your own tests, as tens of thousands like you have done, feeling confident you will join them in praising the gasoline that is first in public service. And now, Chief Davis. Becker, whose name obviously is fictitious, was indeed the guest of California for the next seven years. He was hailed into court, along with his fake actors and actresses, to act as witnesses, and was found guilty of grand theft bunco. He served his time in prison, that training school that has only one text. Crime does not pay. Thank you, Chief Davis. Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 240 at Sunset and Beechwood. Suspects in this case sent to San Quentin. That's all. Rose and Quentin. Jack Becker in tonight's dramatization was played by Lou Merrill. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. <laughs> <laughs> 